morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is amazing to me. I'm here in Sydney, Australia, on an absolutely perfect day, sitting at the waterfront, and all of you have your chairs turned the wrong direction, looking at me instead of looking out there. Good, no pressure. This should be easy. All right. Um, what are we here to talk about? Who am I and why am I here and why are you here? I am, uh, as Darren mentioned, I am a data scientist, a mathematician, and a psychologist by training. My career has been spent largely at the intersection of four areas, technology, psychology, business, and change. And so this is an extraordinary time for me, and it's also an extraordinary time for you, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, my background is a little bit unusual for most people in the room. In fact, you'll raise your hand and share with me if we share a background in common. Uh, currently, I sit on the board of directors for a number of major companies. Prior to that, I was the chief data officer for Time, Inc., where I was also a member of the XCOM, helping to run this wonderful Fortune 50 company. Before that, I was the chief data scientist for Samsung. Before that, I built most of the capabilities you hear about with US intelligence, defense, and security agencies. And so I worked with CIA, with DIA, with FBI, with DHS, with MOUSC, with anybody with letters. I worked for them one time or another, building some of these capabilities that you read about in the press. Before that in my career, I was at various times in the early part of my career, believe it or not, uh, I can't believe it anymore, a paramedic, a police officer, a deep sea rescue diver, and team leader of a scout sniper reconnaissance team with the US Army Special Forces. So this is gonna be an interesting conversation, I hope. Let me do a survey of the room first. Before we begin, let me know who you are. Uh, my geeks, raise your hand. Where are my fellow geeks? Woo! Yep. See, all the non-geeks think that I'm hurting their feelings right now. <laughs> They're loud and proud, raising their hands. Non-geeks, business people, raise your hands. All right. People who wandered in here because there's free breakfast and it seemed like a better place to go than going to work, raise your hands. People who are still drunk and don't know where they are right now, raise your hands. All right, never mind. We know where everyone is, but everyone hopefully is here to talk about and learn a little bit about artificial intelligence and how it's impacting all world and the economy. And to that point, I'm gonna actually disagree with Darren. Uh, I'm gonna make a point of disagreeing with everybody when I'm up here today. It's what I do. Um, that's my wife. Uh, I don't think anybody really does know what artificial intelligence is. I think very few people know. And in fact, um, let me ask you by a show of hands, how many of you feel you have an absolutely solid understanding of what it is people are talking about when they're in the news, on TV, and, and in business meetings even, and they're talking about artificial intelligence, you know exactly what they're talking about. Raise your hands if you would count yourself in that group. One and a half, we're gonna call that. One and a half out of the group. And let me say, I'll join you and say about a half. On any short list, I'm considered to be one of the world's leading experts in applied artificial intelligence. I'm not sure that I'm not sure what it really means. My definition of AI, truly, this is the definition and I've written about this, spoken about this. Those of you who follow me and know me know that this isn't uh, sweet generally the first time I'm saying this. I define artificial intelligence as getting computers to do the kind of stuff that they do on TV and in the movies. <laughs> that, that's really a great definition of AI. That's what AI really is. It's about trying to do what computers do on Star Trek. Hopefully not what they do on The Matrix or in the Terminator movies, but more what they do when you're trying to get computers to do what computers we hope one day we'll be able to do, to understand us and to do what we want and to be able to do the kinds of things that we used to think only we could do. That's really what artificial intelligence is about. And during the course of the day, this morning, in fact, over the next 20 minutes, I want to completely demystify artificial intelligence for you and tell you that it's nothing to be afraid of. Well, it's nothing to be afraid of existentially. It's not really going to kill us all. We're not really going to turn into batteries. Uh, and the only real danger that Arnold Schwarzenegger brings to the world is if he decides to become governor of California again. But other than that, we don't have to worry about the Terminator or any of that nonsense. But I am going to tell you that this is not far from your grasp. And that's an important thing to know because AI is impacting the world more fundamentally than anything in history. And I don't say that lightly. This will be the most transformative force truly in the history of the world. 
The pre-runner for this, I'll argue, was probably, well, let me tell you a little story. I'm a grandpa. Grandpas love to tell stories. So here's a story for you. Let's pretend. Let's pretend you are living and working, not here in beautiful Sydney, but in another peninsula, sitting out and looking out onto the ocean, Manhattan, in New York. You are in New York, New York, in Manhattan, and you're working on Wall Street. Not just anywhere on Wall Street, but at 11 Wall Street, home of the New York Stock Exchange. The date, September 4th, 1882. The building is fairly new. It's only been in place about a dozen years. And this is a time when buildings were heated by coal, lit by lanterns, and the primary mode of transportation was fueled by hay. Don't get me started on the exhaust. This is an extraordinary day, though, because today, September 4th, 1882, just a few blocks away, on Pearl Street, where it intersects Fulton, a young entrepreneurial inventor by the name of Edison is about to flip a switch. And when he does, he's going to usher in the electrical age. He's going to light up the world. Imagine what it would have been like not to be in that square mile, but to be outside that mile, in the dark and looking to the light. That's where we are right now. We've seen more progress in the last couple of years than we've ever seen technologically, scientifically, any time in our history. Technology is accelerating at a pace that's nearly unimaginable. You guys uh, uh, know that reference of dogs. Dogs live seven years to one. My dog currently is 108 in people years, and the damn thing won't die. But dogs are supposed to age faster. Well, technology currently is at a rate of, depending on who you ask, between me and my colleagues, of 10 or 12 to 1. 10 to 1, 12 to 1, which means we're accelerating about 100 years in 10 years. Don't believe me? Show of hands, how many of you don't have a smartphone with you? Any Amish in the room? Raise your hand. No? Anyone, anyone doesn't? No. That's incredible, isn't it? You have more computing power on your hip than existed on the planet when I was born. And it's only been around for about 10 years. It was in 2007, in fact, that Steve Jobs introduced us to the iPhone. Before that, we had no idea what it was. 2007 was a remarkable year. In that year, Facebook broke out of the Harvard campus and became available to all of us. Twitter was born, Airbnb, <clears throat> change.org, the Android operating system, Kindle, Watson, to the geeks in the room, Hadoop, GitHub. This is when we started to let technology loose and let our freak flag fly, and this is only 11 years ago. The last 11 years, 10 years have been extraordinary. They're nothing compared to the last five, the last two. In the last six months, we've made more progress in artificial intelligence than we've made in human history. This is becoming the new reality. The novelist William Gibson, when he was asked by The Economist what he thinks will be in the future and what the future will be like, famously said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And that's the point of the conversation today. That's what I want to talk to you about, is the fact that it's not evenly distributed is a threat to all of you sitting in this room right now. <clears throat> Forrester Research, who's not known for hyperbole, who tends to err on the conservative side, came out and made a projection just last year. They said that businesses adopting AI, IoT, and big data will take, wait for it, $1.2 trillion from their less informed peers by 2020, in a year and a half. They're going to disrupt the economy so radically, they're going to take $1.2 trillion away. To put that in context for you, by the way, the GDP of Australia is $1.8 trillion. The GDP of the US, the largest GDP in the world, is $16.7 trillion. We're talking about a more sizable economic shift than has ever occurred in the history of the world. It's going to happen within the next couple of months. If you're not on board with this, if you're not understanding what's going on here, if you're not able to play, you're going to lose. And the bad news and the sad news is, and the thing I'm here to tell you is, the game is rigged. All of you in this room will lose, unless, unless you take some action, unless you do some things. That's frankly why I'm here. 
I'm here to spread the word and to talk about these things. You know, there, there was a book written about, I think it was about 23 years ago, by a guy named Daniel Corton. He wrote a book that, when I first read it, I thought it was a bunch of dystopian nonsense, and frankly, I didn't even want to read it, but they asked me to do a review, and so I read it. And it was titled, When Corporations Rule the World. I thought it was dystopian ridiculousness. I thought that the idea that a handful of companies would, in the next two decades, have sufficient power to be able to be more powerful than entire governments, to be able to unseat entire industries and sectors? Really? Would that have even been possible for most of us when we were kids? Now, 23 years later, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Alibaba, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, you can count them on two hands, the companies that are dominating nearly every sector and every industry. And here's the scarier, worse news, the truth that we all know. If Amazon, Google, Alibaba, one of these companies isn't already in your industry, it's simply because they don't want to be yet. They haven't seen sufficient opportunity. As soon as they want to walk in, we're all in a lot of trouble. What makes that far, far, far worse, as if it's not bad enough, there was an article that came out in the New York Times on October 22nd, 2017. And by the way, rather than radically and quickly try to write down notes, I'm going to encourage all of you to connect to all of us on the panel on LinkedIn and ask for our cards and stay in touch. Let's keep each other informed of what's going on here. But in this article, October 22nd, 2017, in the New York Times, it was titled, Tech Giants Are Paying Huge Salaries for Scarce AI Talent. The article went on to say that kids, brand new kids, just coming out of school, freshly minted, are getting from these same companies anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 a year US. Any of you have kids that are getting close to going into the workforce? Guess where they need to go, right? Because mom and dad need to retire early. Because the article went on to say that the ones that were the best of the best of the few are being offered salaries in excess of $1.2 million to start. I have someone I know of, and I'll share with you off video at the break uh, when we're chatting later who it is, was offered $1.2 million a year to stay home, to not work for any of the other companies. Didn't even have, don't even have to come to work, just don't work for one of the competition. What are they doing? They're creating an effective data oligops or talent oligopsony. They're gobbling up and monopolizing all the talent. Why? Because in this same article, the New York Times went on to say that in the entire world, there are probably only about 10,000 people who really know what they're doing when you're talking about AI and implementing these AI systems. My friends and I contend, and I'm a handful of a cadre of the people who are leading a lot of the work in this area. In fact, uh, I'll give you a, a flash news announcement. It's never been made, it hasn't been made public before because I just found out yesterday, I just accepted a position and will be leading what will be one of the world's leading laboratories on applied artificial intelligence. Uh, I just accepted the offer yesterday. There's a handful of us. There's about, well, out of those 10,000 people, how many do you think can tell a P&L from a PB&J? can really understand the implications, the applications, and the business aspect of this. It can't be one in a thousand within an order of magnitude. So there's a hundred of us. There's actually about 50 of us, and we know one another. There aren't many people who know what they're doing to be able to stand up, lead, and transform organizations and opportunities using these practices. And these companies are buying them all up. Of those 10,000 people, they're trying to acquire all that, all that talent, and they're leaving all of you in the dark and unplugged in. And what's coming in in the vacuum in its place? We see this cottage industry starting to come up with a bunch of pretenders and snake oil salesmen. We see people who are coming to you and saying, we can build you AI and we can build you all these capabilities. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. That's a big part of what I do now is I literally travel around the world. That's why I'm in Australia now. I had several other meetings, meeting with other organizations that people are saying $2.3 million will bid you a system. That's a complete facade. It doesn't work. It's meaningless. The other side of that is we have, and I've written articles about this one titled The Rise of the Empty Suit. We have these people who are 
uh, MBAs, frankly, from third tier colleges who were out of work, and so they read a couple of copies of Wired Magazine and HBR. They learn the lingo and the language, and they can do the buzzword bingo, and they come in and say, well, I am now a data and an AI guru, and they're full of crap. And people are suffering as a consequence. Organizations are folding as a consequence. What, what's most <laughs> extraordinary about all this is this isn't a conspiracy. This isn't those tech giants getting together and deciding that they're going to screw all of you. It's not collusion. It's actually worse than that. It's more insidious than that. This is merely coincident self-interests. Their interests are to act exactly this way. And it tends to be that there's a small handful of people who can do that. And as we've known since the time of Adam Smith, the invisible hand of the economy works exactly that way. People pursue their rational self-interests, and as a consequence, well, usually things are better off unless you have monopolies, unless you have some of these things. This is a naturally occurring monopoly. It's not, well, I'm not saying, by the way, that, that conspiracies and collusion don't exist, but this isn't the case of some evil dictator looking for a dupe to dope who happens to become I don't know, President of the United States. This is <laughs> not people who are conspiring behind the curtain. They're conspiring in full sight of all of us. They are exploiting the economic inequality and it's creating this vicious cycle. Markets seek stasis. Markets are looking for those opportunities. Companies are seeking those opportunities. Put it in that context where we talked about Edison. Can you imagine any of the companies outside of that mile of lower Manhattan continuing to use coal and lighting by lanterns? Of course not. You've created this de facto standard, and it was the companies that could afford to plug into the electrical grid that survived. You know which company didn't plug in, by the way? Me neither, because we haven't heard their name in 125 years. They died. If you can't plug into the technology, you no longer exist. When a few have all the cards, we all tend to suffer. Well, <laughs> In all fairness, we don't all suffer. I'm not suffering. Uh, I'm doing just fine. Uh, the geeks in the room are going to start to do very, very well. Those of you who are not among the chosen few, however, are finding yourself locked out. And that's absurd. Because it turns out, as I said, well, this is not rocket surgery. This is not hard. Let me ask you a question. By a show of hands, how many of you in this room can code? So we've got about a dozen hands. Most of the rest of you, most of you, probably about 80% of the room, think they can't code. Want to bet? I'm going to teach you to code. The guys who can code are hating me right now because I'm about to be that schmuck who reveals the magician's secret and shows you what's behind the curtain. OK. <laughs> it, it, it'll take about 45 seconds, so you really have to pay attention. This is very complicated stuff. If then, do while else, booleans. You, you think I'm kidding. The guys who are coding are laughing right now. That's the laughter you hear. Those are the people who code because they know I just spoke truth. That is 90% of coding. If then, do while else, booleans. If, if this is going on, then do this. While this is happening, do this. Else, do this. If, then, do, while, else. Some of the guys who code are getting, uh, thinking to themselves, whoa, 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 you forgot about LF, which is a contraction for else, if. Oh, because they're too lazy to write else and write if. You know, let's save that letter if we can, right? But that's the truth. Uh, guys who can code, one of you raise your hand if I'm lying, not telling the truth. You forgot functional programming. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> We uh, forgot functional programming is what he's saying. What he's saying is you could take all that and you can put it into a little package so you don't have to write all that because you wouldn't want to have to write all that over and over again. Come on. If, then, do, well, else. Booleans, oh, I'm sorry. Booleans doesn't mean anything to everyone. Um, I'm going to have to explain to you all of Boolean algebra. Oh, sweating now. All right, ready? Boolean algebra. And or not. That's it. And. So this and this, that or this, this but not this, right? So peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter or jelly, peanut butter not jelly. I'm not kidding. If then do well else and or not. You now know how to code. You do. The only thing left is to learn the syntax. 
And this syntax is which, when to use a semicolon or a curly brace or put in a space. You know what the truth is for all of you who are business people? Who the flip cares? Let the code monkeys do that. Tell them what you want. Let them type it out because now you know what they know. They can't BS you anymore. You know how to code. You really do. Daniel Rushkoff wrote a book, Douglas Rushkoff wrote a book called Program or Be Programmed. I highly recommend reading it. It's more of a polemic, more of a philosophic. It has nothing to do with actually coding, but he's making the point that unless you know how the machine works, you become subsumed by the machine. You become subordinated to the machine. You need to learn how to do this stuff. Those of you who think what I'm telling you is an abstraction and not practical, now I'll teach you an entire computer language. I'm gonna teach you the computer language of SQL, structured query language. Ready for this one? <laughs> Select from where? Booleans. That's it. Okay, uh, who here codes in SQL? Who here understands SQL? Yeah, they all do, by the way. All the geeks know SQL <laughs> because it's the language that they use for manipulating your databases and all the places where you store data, they use SQL. Yeah, I know about NoSQL languages, but we're talking about SQL right now, which NoSQL languages use basically the same syntax, exactly. So, select from where, what does that mean? Everyone here has seen an Excel sheet at one time in their careers, right? Or you've seen a table. If not, you are still drunk and you shouldn't be here right now. Um, if you've ever seen a table, here's how SQL works. Select. Select tells you which columns you want. So think of an employee database. An employee database, what would you have? Employee ID, name, salary, gender, location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which columns do you want? Well, those guys who code, you code in SQL, you know that I'm telling the truth when I say they don't specify the columns, they cheat. And they write select asterisks, which means select all the darn columns, so you don't have to worry about which ones. So select all the columns from, from is the name of the table, where, ah, where is where we bring in Booleans. So this now is a completely legitimate SQL query, we'll write one together. Select asterisks from the employee table where gender equals male, pay is over 20,000, but under $400,000, and gender and uh, location equals Sydney or Melbourne. Those of you who know SQL, am I making that up or is that a perfectly legitimate SQL query? That's it. You all guys all know it now too. This is something that we can all get our hands around. It turns out that AI is actually even simpler to understand. AI, artificial intelligence, is actually sort of a, a, a blanket or an encompassing term that speaks about things like machine learning, robotics, natural language processing, IoT, our, our Internet of Everything analytics, maybe signal processing theory, depending on who you're talking about, but that's really it. Mostly it's about machine learning. You want to learn machine learning? Machine learning, it turns out, is even simpler. The way computers work, you have the machine here, the computer, which will be the column for this purpose, and we have data, we have rules and it spits out answers. Data rules spits out answers. Data rules spits out answers. Data is all that employee data. The rules are fine, do what I want you to do. And the answers are, here's who the employees are. The data could be our CRM system and all the customers we have. The rules are, and I want, if anyone actually uses this term in real life, I may smack you, but millennials. If we want millennials, then it'll give us their names. Machine learning just switches these two things around. Instead of data, rules, and answers, with machine learning, you say data, answers, and it gives you rules. That's it, that's machine learning. That's the truth of it. In essence, what you're doing is you're giving it examples. You're giving it answers, and it's deriving the rules for those things. Why is that important or powerful to us? Think about that. How many of you in this room don't have customers? Anyone? Anyone has no customers, no clients, nobody they have to know. Okay, so we all have that in common. If you want your best customers, how do you do it typically, traditionally, historically, using this traditional computing model? We do it arrogantly. We assume these are the customers we want to know about. These are our best customers. Why do that? Why not instead say, instead of saying, here's the data, now find me women of a certain age, of a certain income, living in a certain area, who bought a certain product. Instead of that, 
why not flip it around and say, these are the ones who are our best customers. They all look like these people. What are the things they have in common? That's a machine learning approach. When we did something like that at Time Magazine, at, uh, for Time Inc., with all of our properties, and by the way, Time, we own uh, Time, Sports Illustrated, People Magazine, Essence, blah, 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 one of the biggest publishers in the world. We were able to increase our lift overnight by 1,037%. 1,037%. That's lift, right? All we did was we took the same data we took the same people we were looking at, and we flipped it around. This is critically important stuff, folks. This isn't just for commerce, though. You know, Vladimir Putin has said that artificial, was it Donald Trump? It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it was, no, it was Putin. Putin said artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. It comes with colossal opportunities, but also threats that are difficult to predict. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. I don't know if he means militarily or economically, but in either case, unfortunately, he's right. The good news is there are things you can do. There's an old Chinese proverb that I love. The best plant time to plant a tree was 100 years ago. The second best time is now. What I'm going to ask all of you to commit to is to start doing these things and looking into these things and investigating this and communicating with me and with us now, not next month, not next year, not tomorrow even. When you get back to the office, from your phone, link into the conversation. I have effectively become a global AI evangelist. I'm going, around, I'm going from here, I go back home shortly, and then I'll be in Azerbaijan, and I'll be in London. I'm all over the world. I'm not asking for anything other than I have a, a deep-seated sense of fairness about this, and it bothers the hell out of me that a handful of companies are going to rule, in the world, rule the world and all of you are going to be on the sideline and screwed. It doesn't seem right to me. I'm trying to help small and mid-sized companies, the people who can't afford to invest the $1.2 billion that JP Morgan just invested. And by the way, JP Morgan investing that money, JP Morgan just implemented a system that they call COIN, Contract Investigation System. It's performing largely the same work that was previously done by lawyers and loan officers. Going through these contracts and looking through a bunch of these forms that it's important work, but you need to check every line of every contract. Not built for a human. Humans don't do that kind of work as effectively as a machine does. They train their machines to do it, and they flipped on the switch, and in three minutes, the coin system was able to do the work that had previously taken their lawyers and loan officers 360,000 hours. What is it that J.P. Morgan did with that additional productivity? They did not lay off 144 lawyers and loan officers, which is what that would equate to. Instead, they let them be lawyers and loan officers. They let them not try to be computers. There's a concept in AI known as Moravec's paradox. Moravec's paradox, in plain English, says Computers are really, really good at the things people are bad at, and people are really, really bad at the things computers are good at. What is the cube root of 3,256,323? It'll take you a second. I'm not, I don't have that kind of patience, obviously. But if I asked anyone in this room who's better looking, me or George Clooney, as long as you have eyes, you can pretty much figure that out, right? A computer can't figure that one out. It's impossible, and yet, for us, it's trivial. What's trivial for us is hard for the computer and vice versa. We get to take advantage of more of X paradox. It turns out we also hate doing those things and computers excel at them and vice versa. The things that frustrate and crash computers are the things we do without even thinking about it. Take advantage of that. Don't become a meat machine. And you've all met meat machines. You've met them this week. Oh, sorry, that's the rules. Sorry, I'm just following the procedure. Sorry, I just got to do things this way. Take the number. I literally, when I was checking in for the flight from Melbourne, I had my bag had to be checked. And she said, oh, you know, bag's over. And we got to charge you for it. All right, you have to go down to the other counter to take care of that. All right, so I go down to the other counter. Here she comes. <laughs> Hi, can I help you, she says. Uh, I, I think my bag might be over. Oh, how much over? I don't know. 
we'll have to check with the other lady. And I started walking back to the other counter. She comes back to the counter. Hi, can I help you? I said, yeah, that's my bag. Is it overweight? Yes, it is. I need to pay for it. OK, that's the other counter. I'm not kidding. I was amused. I love this. I did it five times. I kept going back and forth with this lunatic. She's a meat machine. She's not a real human being. My algorithms can beat that, right? Don't do that. I wrote an article about exactly this. I wrote an article that was nothing so much as an homage to my wife. I published it on LinkedIn. I titled it, Robots Will Never Take This Job. My wife is, I, I've had a weird life. I actually, um, uh, I've had a chance to meet every American president since Reagan. I worked for President Obama. I uh, have met truly uh, kings and billionaires. I, I spent an afternoon with the Dalai Lama. I studied with Nobel laureates, Fields Medal recipients, far and away. My wife is the most extraordinary person I've ever met. She's brilliant. She's compassionate. She's, she's 20 times the human being I am. She was going one day on a march down to Washington, D.C. to protest. Do you know why? Because my wife is an ICU nurse. She's been working at the bedside for, if I say this on camera, she'll kill me, but almost 40 years, tending to people in the worst circumstances of their lives possibly. She was going down to Washington to march because she thought they needed even better nursing quality of care because the nurse to patient ratios are higher than they should be. So she spent her time off to be able to do this. I was so moved by it. I wrote this article, Robots Will Never Take This Job. And I made the point that robots will eventually be able to do 80% of what my wife does probably, maybe 90%. They'll be able to dispense pills and be able to change bandages and they'll be able to administer uh, medications and start IVs. There are two things though that my wife does that they'll never do. They will never have judgment and compassion. They'll never have judgment, they'll never have humanity. There are a list of things that the machines will never have that we have. They'll never have our sense of wonder and curiosity. They'll never have our wisdom. They'll never have some of those essential things that essentially make us human. You cultivate those and you learn to create a career that's symbiotic with the machines. Instead of fighting the machines or worrying about them, taking your jobs. You know, when people ask me what I do, I say it on my business card, it says I'm an artificial intelligence, but I'm really not. I'm an intelligence augmentation. Not AI, but IA. And using the technology to better enable us to become more fully human. You take that approach, you take that perspective, you start learning how you can work more synchronously with these systems, you can change everything. And this matters not just to you personally, although frankly that's probably enough. It matters certainly to your country to your companies, it matters to your country. Right now, the race is on, and we're trying to decide who's going to lead that race for AI that Putin was talking about. It's unlikely it'll be the US, by the way. It may be China, it may be India, it may be Canada, it may be the UK, and it may be Australia. Australia is in the hunt, Australia is in the race. What you have to decide for yourselves, for your companies, for your countries, is, is it time to step out of the dark and get plugged into the light? Where do you want to be and when the lights go on and when the lights are still off? That's up to you. Those are all the comments I have for you. Thank you very much.